Hello everyone, my name is Divya Oberoi. I am from the National Center for Radio Astrophysics in Pune and today I am going to talk to you about the radio sun. So let us start from a familiar perspective. As you all know that the spectrum of our sun is well modeled by that of a black body, right? In fact, that is true of all stars. Now, in reality, the actual spectrum of the sun differs from that of a black body because of presence of various absorption lines, but it is still a very useful model to learn about our sun. And in case of our sun, given its temperature is about 5800 Kelvin, the peak of the spectrum lies in the visible range at about half a micrometer. Now, the radio frequencies which we want to talk about in this lecture, if I have to put them on the same plot as this, that's, this plot would begin to look something like what is on your screen now. So, the radio regime is shown by the big red arrow there. And you would notice that if I were to extend the black body curve corresponding to the sun into this regime, the energy being emitted by the sun in this regime is even more than 10 orders of magnitude lower than what it is emitting in the visible regime. So, one would wonder why is it even interesting to study a star so far away from its peak. And I hope that by the end of this lecture, I will convince you that actually radio studies of the sun give you information which you could not have obtained by any other means and are really very interesting to understand our sun. Okay? So, let us get started. So, in this plot, I have added a few more lines. This curve here corresponds to the black body curve corresponding to an object at about a million Kelvin. This one here is for an object at a billion Kelvin and this one here is for an object at 10 to the power 12 Kelvin. And these curves here at the bottom, the blue one at the bottom shows you the actual spectrum, a schematic of the actual spectrum for the quiet sun and the red one on top shows you a schematic for the spectrum of the active sun. So, you notice that by the time you are at meter wavelength range, the emission from the sun is actually quite different from what you would expect from a black body at 5800 Kelvin and we will now try to understand why does that happen and where does the quiet sun and the active sun emission come from. So, before we start on that, let us establish some basic terminology, right? So, the Planck's law you are already familiar with, you could express it in terms of either per hertz or per wavelength, right? So, on the top, the first expression is the expression for the Planck's law expressed in units of watts per meter square per hertz per steradian. If you were to express the same thing in units of wavelength, the per hertz gets replaced by per meter. Now, at radio wavelengths, the exponent of the exponential in the denominator of the Planck spectrum h nu by k t is much, much smaller than 1. So, in this regime, one can make the, an, an approximation and the Planck's law reduces to what is called the Rayleigh Jeans law and that is what is the bottom most equation here, where the brightness of a given object is simply twice k t divided by lambda squared, where lambda is the wavelength of emission. Okay. Now, radio astronomers like to use another construct which is called the brightness temperature. If you were to look at the Rayleigh Jeans law once again, the quantity on the left hand side is something which you have measured observationally. The quantity on the right hand side has really only one free parameter because Kb is known and the wavelength at which you are observing is also known. The remaining free parameter is what is referred to as the brightness temperature of a body. So, this is simply the temperature of a black body which would have produced the emission which has been measured. So, this is a very useful construct uh, which radio astronomers like to use a lot. Do keep in mind that this brightness temperature is measured in units of per steradian, right? So, it is a surface brightness quantity whether you get close to that object or go far away from that, the surface brightness of that does not change. And on the next slide, we introduce something called flux density, which is the brightness which has been integrated over this, the integrated over the solid angle. Radio astronomers express flux density in units of Jansky and 1 Jansky is equal to 10 to the power minus 26 watts per meter square per hertz. Because the sun is so much brighter than a typical radio source, solar astronomers use a different unit called the solar flux unit or an SFU and 1 SFU is equal to 10,000 Janskys. 
It is also useful to define another quantity called specific intensity which is measured in units of Jansky's per beam or SFU's per beam which is essentially you, you take an, uh, an angular size which is equal to the resolution element of the instrument and integrate the brightness temperature over that and that is what gives you the specific intensity of a given object. Okay. Now let us get back to our sun. So here is a picture of the sun taken during an eclipse. Uh, this was close to the solar minima, this was the 2006 eclipse and as soon as you look at it, the dipolar nature of the sun's magnetic field jumps out at you. What you are seeing here is the sunlight scattered by the electrons in the atmosphere of the sun, which we refer to as the corona. And you see that uh, this medium is so faint that you have to wait for an eclipse to even become aware of its presence. There is this thin tenuous plasma which surrounds the sun and is also permeated by a magnetic field and the magnetic field can have all sorts of shapes and structures in there. Okay. There is one more thing to note about this medium which is what is shown in this plot. So on the x-axis here is distance or is height from the surface of the sun in units of kilometer and on the y-axis to the left is the temperature of this medium. That is denoted by this solid curve here. So the region just above the photosphere, the visible surface of the sun is what is referred to as the chromosphere and here the temperature is very similar to that of the photosphere. But as you get a few thousand kilometers up, you suddenly encounter a region which is referred to as the transition region where the temperature increases by almost two orders of magnitude. It hits about a million Kelvin and that is the region which is called the corona. If you look at this dashed curve, this corresponds to the y-axis on the right side and that gives you the density of this medium per centimeter cube. And you find that this rise in the temperature is accompanied by an equally dramatic fall in the density of this medium. So now we know that this corona is actually full of very hot plasma, the density of which is falling dramatically as you go further away and this region is full of magnetic fields. Now what would happen, what sort of an emission would really hot plasma give, right? And that is what we refer to as the thermal emission or Bremsstrahlung. So the, we said that this is plasma at about a million Kelvin. So if this is in thermal equilibrium, its particle distribution is described well by a Maxwellian and such a distribution of plasma gives rise to what we call thermal radiation. Quantitatively, the shape of this spectrum will depend on really the details of this plasma, how many collisions actually take place, which depends on the density of the medium. How, what is the distribution of the impact uh, parameter for these collisions? So how close do these electrons pass to the ions or the protons? How fast were these electrons moving as they were being scattered by the ions? So if you put, take all of this into account and come up with an expression for the opacity or the optical depth of this medium, that is what is shown at the very bottom of this slide. So that the tau or the optical depth is uh, an integral along the entire path of the ray through this medium and it is proportional to the various quantities which are shown here. So squared of the electron density in the numerator, nu to the power 2.1 in the denominator and another t to the power 3 by 2 in the denominator. So what you can readily notice from here is that as your frequency decreases, the optical depth of this medium actually dramatically increases and that is exactly what is happening in the corona. So in this region which is highlighted by this, uh, uh, in this red ellipse, that is where the optical depth of this corona is becoming substantial enough that the sun has slowly moved from being a black body at about 5800 Kelvin to being a black body at about a million Kelvin. So this is really where the quiet sun emission is coming from. It is just the thermal emission from the million Kelvin corona which sits on top of the sun. Okay. Now what all can we learn about the sun from this Bremsstrahlung? Right. So I already mentioned that the optical depth which you measure or the optical depth uh, observed is an integral along the entire ray path. And we have also seen that the density of the, this medium changes quite rapidly in the corona. So what that means is that the refractive index seen by a given ray is also going to change, right? As it progresses, it is going to follow Snell's law and get refracted depending on the local refractive index. 
and the figure here shows the refractive bending of electromagnetic waves at 200 megahertz in a realistic model for the solar coronal density. So, you notice that these rays at 200 megahertz, they form a sort of surface of closest approach, that they do not come any closer than this. If I was to change my frequency to a higher frequency, I would be able to penetrate deeper and if I was to go to a lower frequency, this surface would move further out. So, by dialing my frequency knob up and down, I can actually make myself sensitive to different layers of the sun and it is at this place of closest approach where I am picking up the largest contribution to my optical depth because remember the optical depth was proportional to any squared which is changing quite rapidly as you move further out. So, by making wideband observations at these frequencies, we can understand different layers of the corona, a little bit like peeling different layers of an onion. It is very interesting to get this information because actually none of our other means of studying the sun, for example, the coronographs or observations at EUV and X-ray are currently able to give this information. The functioning coronographs at the moment, their fields of view start beyond two solar radii and the fields of view of most EUV and X-ray uh, telescopes do not extend to beyond 1.3 solar radii. Okay. There is one more thing which these observations can get you, which I had not mentioned earlier. This is that because this is magnetized plasma, this is birefringent in nature, which means that electromagnetic radiation propagating along and perpendicular to the magnetic field sees slightly different refractive indices. A consequence of that is that even the unpolarized light, which is being given out as brent Rolland, picks up a tiny amount of circular polarization because of this birefringence. If we are able to measure this really small degree of polarization, this will give us the ability to measure the average magnetic field along the line of sight. This would be actually a very good way, of, also the only known way of getting average magnetic fields in the corona. Now, let us talk about the non-thermal emission. So, the non-thermal emissions are associated with what is typically referred to as solar activity, right. So, this solar activity has a range of different sorts of things. They could be short and well-defined flares or bursts. EUV and X-ray astronomers like to use terminology including the name flares, while radio astronomers tend to call them bursts. They could also be storms which can last for days on end, right. It is convenient to divide these active emissions into two broad categories, incoherent emissions and coherent emissions. The incoherent emissions can be further divided into two classes, gyrosynchrotron and gyroresonance. Gyrosynchrotron uh, emissions, they are essentially because of the presence of magnetic field in this corona. They come from highly relativistic electrons as they gyrate along these magnetic fields. Where do we find highly relativistic electrons in the corona? They are born or they get accelerated to these very high velocities at the sites of flares, the same places where coronal mass ejections arise. And the observed brightness temperatures corresponding to them have ranged so far from about 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 7 Kelvin. Gyro resonance is a very similar phenomena except that the electrons involved are not highly relativistic but only mildly relativistic. And this emission tends to have a resonance where the frequency of emission is equal to some harmonic of the local gyro frequency. Right? So, this as you would imagine becomes important in regions of strong magnetic fields. And where do we find strong magnetic fields on the sun? Well, you find them on the surface of the sun close to the or inside the active regions. So, gyro resonance is typically observed from these active regions. In addition to these, there is another class of mechanisms which have, uh, which give rise to coherent emissions and they mostly come from the class of emissions referred to collectively as plasma emissions, okay. Now, coherent emissions uh, are very easy to recognize on the sun because their brightness temperatures are very, very high. You can be absolutely sure that they, the observed brightness temperatures do not correspond 
to the physical temperature of anything on the sun. In fact, brightness temperatures up to about 10 to the power 15 Kelvin have been measured. Because these emissions are coherent, they tend to be narrow band. And these emissions take place at the local plasma frequency and it's harmonic. And the local plasma frequency, as you know, is proportional to the square root of the local electron density. This emission can have a very elaborate structure in the, in the frequency and time plane. And before we get to it, let's take a look at which classes of emission mechanisms are important in which parts of the solar spectrum. Okay. So, uh, this figure shows frequency on the x-axis and on the y-axis it shows height above the solar surface. On the right-hand side, the height is measured in units of solar radii and on the left-hand side, it is measured in units of kilometers. Right? And it has a few characteristic curves which are shown here. So, for example, this solid curve here corresponds to the plasma frequency. Now, plasma frequency is the lowest frequency which can propagate freely in that plasma. Any lower frequency tends to get absorbed in that plasma. The curve just beneath that corresponds to the height at which the free free emission corresponding to that frequency achieves a tau equals 1, right? achieves an optical depth of 1. Right? So, below at higher frequencies than where this happens, the plasma would essentially be transparent to this. This is the reason why if you were to look at these high frequency side uh, of this plot, this new tau equals 1 is sitting at the transition region. Right? That the rest of the corona is actually transparent at this particular frequency. There are three other parallel lines here which correspond to the gyro frequency and its third and tenth harmonic for the case of coronal magnetic fields. Okay. Now, typically the dominant emission mechanism comes from whichever curve happens to be on the top. So, it so happens for our coronal conditions, it is the third and the tenth harmonic of the gyro frequency which are observed most readily. And in this regime, say above a few gigahertz, it is typically the gyro resonance uh, and the gyro cyclotron emissions which are seen most prominently. In this regime here, where the free free emission begins to become dominant, you begin to see the bremsstrahlung. As you go further down, it is the plasma emission which begins to become more dominant. In the regime, say between about a few, many tens of megahertz and a gigahertz, you tend to observe both plasma and bremsstrahlung. And beneath that, it is the plasma emission which is the most dominant form of emission which you see from the solar corona. Okay. Now, how do you measure the radio emission which is coming from the sun? Well, we have two large classes of instruments. The first ones and historically which were also the first ones to be made are called spectrographs. These are single dishes or single elements and what they do is that they measure the spectrum of the sun as a function of time. So, they can give you a whole stack of spectra allowing you to look at how the flux density of the sun has been changing both along the time and along the spectral dimension simultaneously. But because these things are integrating over the whole disk of the sun, they are gathering information from the entire sun, they cannot give you any information about the location or the morphology of this radio emission on the surface of the sun or how it correlates to some other features which were present on the sun and so on. The other class of instruments are called interferometers. These uh, instruments, they are imaging devices. They can actually make an image of the sun. So, th the modern telescopes in fact can provide you a four dimensional database where you have the intensity of the sun as a function of the position on the sun as well as time and frequency. Okay. Now, let us look at how these various classes of radio emissions which we have seen, what are their structures in the frequency time plane. We said earlier that the coherent emissions, they tend to have pretty elaborate structures in the frequency time plane. So, along the x axis here is time and along the y axis is the frequency of observation. 
So, this plot gives an overview of the various kinds of emissions which are observed from the coherent emission mechanisms and it highlights the variety of uh, frequency time structure which you see from these objects. It also shows how they are related to each other in the sense that on the x axis is time since uh, some large flare took place in units of minutes and on the y axis is the frequency. Among the very first bursts to be seen are something called type 3 bursts which look like vertical streaks on this plane. They are quickly followed by some emission which is referred to as type 5 bursts and two other uh, sort of sweeping lines which are referred to as type 2 bursts. In addition at much higher frequencies there are sort of large continuums of emission which take place uh, which fill up many many uh, hundreds of megahertz worth of spectrum referred to as microwave bursts. We will talk about these type 2s and type 3 bursts in more detail as we go along. Okay. So, type 2 bursts, these bursts are actually driven by shocks. So, they require the material to be moving at speeds typically greater than about a thousand kilometers per second to be able to drive a substantial shock in the corona. They are very bright. Their flux densities range from about 0.1 mega Jansky to about a giga Jansky. In terms of duration, they can last from anywhere from about 5 minutes to 15 minutes or so. As you can see in this figure, which shows emission drifting from higher frequencies to lower frequencies, the emission seems to drift at drift rates ranging between 0.1 to a few megahertz per second. This emission also is sort of divided into two distinct bands. These happen to be the fundamental and the harmonic. Because this emission is coherent in nature, it cannot be very broadband in nature and the fractional bandwidths tend to not exceed 15 percent, though there are large variations which are seen here. Right? Okay. Now, let us try to understand what would give rise to an emission like this. So, like we said, this type 2 emission comes from electrons which have been accelerated at the locations of the shocks. What is driving these shocks? That is what is being shown here in this picture. So, imagine a CME, a coronal mass ejection which has taken place on the sun. It has a big magnetic cloud or a flux rope associated with it and is now moving fast out through the corona. Ahead of it, it is compressing the medium and because it is moving at a super alphanic velocity, it is driving a shock and that shock is what is shown by this black line and this is where these electrons are being accelerated. Now, as this shock is propagating further and further into the corona, it is moving into regions of lower and lower electron density. And because as the emission which is coming from these electrons which have been accelerated at the shock, it is at the local plasma frequency and its harmonic. As the shock is progressing further out, the frequency of this emission is also dropping. And that is the drop which you were seeing on the previous slide. So, this already tells you that just by observing this shock, just by looking at the frequency of this emission already tells me the local electron density from the medium where it must be propagating. If I have a good model for the coronal electron density and I can measure the speed at which this emission is drifting, it now also allows me to figure out how fast this CME must be traversing through the corona. Okay. Now, I also wanted to point out that these uh, fundamental and harmonic emission bands are often themselves split into two lanes. These are believed to be associated with a shock which is propagating forward and a shock which is propagating in the reverse direction, both coming from the electrons which have been accelerated at the location of this shock. And that is what I wanted to show in this example. So, here is a, a pretty classic type 2 burst these two lower things are the two lanes F1 and F2 of the fundamental. Similarly, here is the harmonic and as you can see, the harmonic also has two distinct lanes which you could see. And as was shown a few slides ago, the type 2 is preceded by a group of type 3s. There is quite a few of them here and there is an isolated one which took place a little earlier. Okay. So, next I wanted to talk about type 3 radio bursts a little bit. So, these things are also driven by very fast moving electrons, but this time these are not large scale shocks, but small electron beams which are moving at very high speeds of order about one third the speed of light. They are also very bright, 
Their flux densities at 169 gigahertz have been measured to range between 0.1 mega Jansky and about a mega Jansky. Though usually they are observed below 300 megahertz, they have been observed uh, to take place all the way from about a gigahertz all the way down to about 10 kilohertz. At about metric wavelengths or around 300 megahertz or so, they usually last about a second or less. Their durations as a function of frequency can be estimated by this empirical rate. They drift very fast because these are electrons which are moving at one third the speed of light. They traverse the corona very quickly and therefore their drift rates are order 100 megahertz per second. The drift rate is negative because you are going from a larger frequency to a smaller frequency. So the number should really be minus 100 megahertz per second or so. And here again, the emission occurs both at the fundamental and the harmonic band, except that it becomes often very difficult to disentangle the two just because of the very fast drift rate of these uh, beams or these bursts. Here is a cartoon which tries to show the physical picture from where these type 3 emissions would arise. So there is an active region here at, uh, from where this line is starting. This is the place where this beam of electrons got energized. This blue curve shows the Parker magnetic field spiral which is connected to this particular place and this is the path which these electron beam is going to take. These dashed curves here, they correspond to the places where the plasma frequency reaches a particular mentioned frequency here. So for example, 250 megahertz or 10 megahertz or 1 megahertz and so on. So by following this emission across frequency, we can find out how this electron beam is traversing across the corona. And that's a piece of information which we cannot get from any other means. So I also wanted to give you a few examples of radio interferometers of the radio imaging devices. And these are, uh, this is by no means a complete list. These are just three different instruments which have been chosen to highlight the differences across the classes of interferometers which one can see or one has. So at the very top is the Atacama large millimeter and submillimeter array. This covers very high frequency range from about 30 gigahertz to about 1000 gigahertz. It has a large number of elements, a large number of dishes, some 66 of them. Though individually, individually the dishes are not very large, about 12, meter, 12 meters and 7 meters, the two kinds of dishes. It sits at a very high altitude, at a, mean, at a height above mean sea level of almost 5000 meters in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Right? Uh, to put this in perspective, the height of Everest is something like 8,800 meters or so. And you see here that this dish is basically a solid surface. The next telescope I wanted to talk about is the GMRT, which works at a frequency range almost three orders of magnitude below ALMA. Right? It covers a frequency range from 150 to 1,500 megahertz. These dishes are huge in size, they are 45 meters. There are 30 of them and it is located about 80 kilometers north of Pune. It's not a particularly high site, it is just about 600 meters above mean sea level. Quite surprisingly, these dishes are transparent, quite unlike that of ALMA, because they work at wavelengths which are long enough that even a, even a steel mesh can work as a good reflector for these. And the last example of an interferometer I wanted to give was that of the Murchison Wide Field Array. This is one of the elements of the array and this is just a collection of dipoles. It doesn't even look like a dish. And it is just the radiation gathered by these group of 16 dipoles which is combined together to form the signal which an element receives. This works at an even lower frequency range of 80 to 300 megahertz. And the size of this dish, or the size of this tile rather, is just 5 meters by 5 meters. It has a much larger number of elements though, 128 and it is located in the Western Australian outback. And just a curious fact about that place is that the population density there is about 3 millihumans per square kilometer. So it's a very desolate place, nobody really wants to live there. <laughs>
Now, how does one make a radio image using an interferometer like this? Now, in this particular lecture, I will only give you a very basic idea of how a radio interferometer works and that can simply be understood by looking at what a parabolic dish does, right. So, on this top here is an example of a parabolic dish. So, this was my plane wave front and if I start from here on this wave front, I hit this point P1 and I come to the focus and no matter where I start from this wave front, I hit the reflecting surface of my parabolic dish and end up back at the focal point, right. So, the key property of a parabolic dish is that it adds parallel light which is incident on it in a coherent manner. By making sure that the path length of all these rays is equal by the time they arrive at focus, so they will always arrive in phase. Now, this property of the parabola still remains even if I was to remove some segments of this parabolic dish as is shown in the bottom figure. So, imagine that I paint some part of my parabolic dish black or I simply dismantle some part of this parabolic dish. Whatever is the remaining part of that parabolic dish, whatever segments remain, all the light which is falling on them will still add in phase at the focus. Now, imagine further that I take each of these mirror segments and place them somewhere else. But as long as I know exactly where I have placed them, I can make the arrangement to delay the signal from them by exactly the right amount so that we can add the signal in phase, right. So, in a sense, this is what an interferometer is trying to do. It is comprised of these elements of parabolic mirrors which are scattered all over the place but we know exactly where they are so that we can add light coherently from them. There is an additional part which is about gathering the data which has been added in phase and converting it into a mirror and that is the process of synthesis imaging uh, which would hopefully be covered in a different lecture. Okay. Now, let us look at the results from these interferometric images of the sun. So, this, this figure here shows you what the sun looks like at a range of different frequencies starting from the highest frequency of 17 gigahertz at the bottom and going to something like 410 megahertz at the top. So, at the high frequency of 17 gigahertz, the sun looks sort of familiar. It has a sharp disk, it is the same size as you expect the optical sun to be. It is the active regions here which appear bright and in fact, different columns here are images taken on almost successive days. So, you can see the same feature move slightly, at least the long lived features move slightly as the sun rotates. As you go to a somewhat lower frequency of about 5.7 gigahertz, you notice that the contrast between the disk of the sun and the active regions have grown larger, right. This is because sun is still pretty close to a black body at 17 gigahertz, a black body corresponding to about 5800 Kelvin. And as you go lower in frequency, the emission of that black body is decreasing, while the emission from these active regions is actually increasing, giving rise to a larger contrast in these regions. And again, you can see these regions rotate across the disk of the sun. If you look at the image at 410 megahertz, that looks very different from what you expect the sun to be, right. It is a fuzzy ball, it does not have a sharp boundary, it is much larger than the optical disk of the sun and that is because at these frequencies now all of this emission which you are seeing is arising in the corona which is sitting well above the optical disk of the sun. The differences in, in intensity in this image are telling you about the differences in electron density in the corona. So, this large dark region which is a large stable region which you can see a rotate across the solar disk corresponds to a coronal hole. And this bright region corresponds to a place where there is a larger electron density as compared to the coronal hole here. So, next I wanted to give you a few examples from each of the telescopes which I had briefly mentioned. And here uh, in this particular example, this is a this is an attempt to combine data from two different telescopes, from a telescope called the Nancy Radio Heliograph in France, which has been historically amongst the most productive radio telescopes, uh, radio interferometers which have ever been there, and the GMRT, the Giant Meter Radio Telescope in India, at a frequency of 327 megahertz. Now, the characteristics of the Nancy Radio Heliograph are that they are 
that instrument is sensitive to large angular scale emission including the full disk of the sun and that of the GMRT is that it can offer you much much higher resolution than the NAMSA radio heliograph. And the idea of this behind this experiment was to combine the data from these two to achieve a significantly better imaging performance than would have been possible by either of the two instruments. And in fact, that experiment was very successful. The, this image is from the NANSE radio heliograph alone and this circle here represents the resolution of this telescope. The central panel is from GMRT alone and this circle again represents the resolution of GMRT while this panel represents image made by combining the data from NANSE and GMRT both. Right? Now you would notice that the quality of this image is certainly superior to the other two and the dynamic image of this, the dynamic range of this combined image is somewhere between 250 and 420. Even though this dynamic range is larger than what it was before, it is not sufficient for the disk of the sun to become visible in the presence of these very bright sources. So what, what they have achieved is that though they have managed to improve the dynamic range, it is still quite insufficient to be able to see the thermal emission in presence of these active emissions. Another very interesting thing which came out of this work is that it demonstrated that the angular sizes of the compact sources on the sun can actually be much smaller than the expectations which have been built on the basis of uh, expectations for scattering in the corona. Another example I wanted to give you was from a different telescope. It is called, it goes by the name the Jansky Very Large Array. These observations were made between 1 and 2 gigahertz and this panel A here has as its background image uh, an EUV image of an active region at 131 angstroms and the red contours here they correspond to X-ray emissions observed between 12 and 25 uh, keV. Now all of these dots on these symbols which you see here they are centroids of burst of a particular type 3 burst which was uh, imaged and the, this data was gathered between some one and a half minute or so and these colors represent frequency with higher frequencies being red and lower frequencies being blue. And now you remember that this type 3 bursts are supposed to arise because of an electron beam which is going to start from a lower height and travel upward. At these lower heights the electron densities are larger so the plasma frequency is larger. So the emission is more likely to uh, or the emission will occur at a higher frequency and it will drift to a lower frequency as it moves further up. This is exactly what you see in this particular image. In panels B, C and then from D through G are shown successive snapshots each of only a 100 millisecond integration of the centroids of all of the type 3 emission which was observed which actually shows you this emission traveling further out as, it, as you go to successive time frames. Now you must make images with really very high time resolutions, right? This is a resolution of 0.1 second to be able to see this motion. And this was among the first works which very clearly established this correlation between the presence of a hard X-ray source and the presence of this uh, EUV emission which was also coming from here and the, the motion of the radio emission going to higher heights with time. I wanted to give you also another example, this one from ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array. Now this is a very new telescope and it is still being commissioned for the use of solar science. But the big advantage of this telescope is that this telescope is actually studying not the corona but the chromosphere, the layer which is lying just beneath the corona and it is still at a temperature of something like 10,000 Kelvin or so. So this telescope operates in the frequency range from 30 to 1000 gigahertz and it is the chromosphere which is optically thick. Now the big advantage of this telescope is that the observed brightness temperature is naturally going to be very close to the physical temperature of the plasma and this plasma is always in the local thermal equilibrium as opposed to the lines of various ions which you would observe or very high ionization states of uh, elements which are which have significant departures from the local th thermodynamic equilibrium forcing you to make various assumptions about it and so on. This plasma because it is in local thermodynamic equilibrium 
it makes the modeling much, much easier and the results much more reliable. And as a comparatively early step towards this uh, process, here is an example where on the left panel, uh, you have an ALMA image at 3 mm wavelength or 100 gigahertz uh, frequency. This yellow circle marks the field of view of the ALMA telescope. The image on the left shows observations from ALMA at a wavelength of 3 mm or a frequency of 100 gigahertz. This thin yellow circle marks the field of view of the ALMA telescope. On the right, we have an image uh, taken in the wavelength of H alpha, which is 6563 angstrom, which has traditionally been regarded as a diagnostic of the chromospheric temperature. So, if you look at it in detail, you find good, very good correspondence between what is seen by ALMA and what is seen uh, in the H alpha image. If you notice more carefully, you also see some places of departure. There is also a difference of the time resolution between these two images. This, the image on the left, the ALMA observation has a time resolution of a few seconds, while this image has a time resolution of about 20 seconds. So, by looking at this, these variations in uh, brightness, one can actually estimate small variations in temperature and density in the chromosphere, which is a fantastic advance. Okay. okay. So now I wanted to, in the, in the last few slides here, I wanted to talk about some of the observations we have been doing using the Murchison Wide Field Array at low radio frequencies. So I wanted to start with an example of a dynamic spectrum from this instrument. A dynamic spectrum is simply just a stack of spectra as a function of time. Right? So on the x-axis here is frequency and on the y-axis here is time. The time resolution here is 0 0.5 seconds and the spectral resolution is 40 kilohertz. This is not a continuous spectrum, but many small pieces of the spectrum which have been placed next to each other. Each of these chunks is about 2.5 megahertz wide and there are 12 such chunks and these numbers here give you the central frequencies or approximate central frequencies of each of these chunks. So you can span the spectrum all the way from 80 megahertz to 300 megahertz and simultaneously and something which immediately jumps out at you is the amount of structure which you see in this emission. Right. There, is, there are thin fibers of emission practically everywhere. Some of these fibers are such that they spread across neighboring bands. Some others are such that they are seen only in one band but are absent in a band which is maybe just 15 megahertz away. So this suggests that in detail the radio emission from the sun, especially at metric frequencies, is actually very dynamic, is very it has a lot of structure both as, as a function of time and as a function of frequency. And the strength of this particular instrument, the MWA is actually that for every single pixel on this plot, we can make an image. And if you were to actually do it, just using these five minutes of data, you will end up with almost half a million images. Right? And this for the first time would allow us to actually see how the variations in intensity which we are seeing in time and frequency here, how do they translate to variations in the morphology of the source? Where are these sources? How do they relate to other sources which are present on the sun and so on and so forth? But if you have to make these millions of images, you naturally cannot make them using the standard traditional human effort intensive process. We must develop some automated imaging pipelines not only these imaging pipelines must be automated, they must also be very robust and very fault tolerant so that they can deal with all sorts of data which uh, is thrown at them. So here are some examples of the results from a pipeline which we have developed for this work. The image on the left is comes from a time when a type 2 burst was taking place. As I had mentioned, these are among the brightest bursts which you can see on the sun and that is where the location of the burst is. This yellow dotted circle or dashed circle rather is supposed to mark the optical disk of the sun and you can see that the radio sun is actually substantially larger than the optical size of the sun. This image was made with a resolution of only 40 kilohertz and just half a second and the lowest contour here is 0.07 percent of the peak intensity. Right. So the imaging dynamic range here, the imaging dynamic range simply refers to what is the faintest feature which you can reliably measure, uh, the ratio of that to the peak of the flux density which has been measured. 
So, the imaging dynamic range here is about 10 to the power 5, it actually exceeds 10 to the power 5. On the right panel, we show a different image taken from among the quietest times observed on the sun, where the maximum contrast on the disk of the sun is close to a factor of 2. It is much more challenging to image under these conditions and even here we are able to achieve an imaging dynamic range of about a thousand. So, these two images sort of span uh, the range of conditions which you might encounter for solar imaging. The peak brightness temperature here corresponds to something like 10 to the power 9 Kelvin, while the peak, peak brightness here, temperature here corresponds to something like few times 10 to the power 5. Okay. Okay. So, next I wanted to show you some applications of these very high dynamic range images which we have made. Okay. So, one of these applications is actually to be able to estimate the magnetic fields associated with the CMEs. Right. Now, we had earlier mentioned uh, gyro synchrotron emission and we also said that this emission is expected to be associated with coronal mass ejections. Now, in spite of this expectation, it has been very hard to measure this gyrosynchrotron emission from the CMEs primarily because the brightness temperature associated with this emission is much, much lower than the brightness temperature of even the quiet sun and usually they are observed when some activity is taking place which makes it even harder to observe the, the much weaker gyrosynchrotron emission. In this image, we show you an example uh, where the background image comes from the Lasco C2 coronograph and the contours come from an MWA radio image made at about 130 megahertz. The lowest contour here is at 0.02 percent of the peak and the contours increase in factors of 2. The various regions which are marked in blue and black, they correspond to some regions of the CME which have been identified. So, the blue corresponds to the base of the CME while the black corresponds to the flank of the CME and you can ignore the red regions for now. For one of these regions which is marked in yellow here, we show two spectra. So, there are eight measurements across the 80 to 300 megahertz band of the MWA for these regions and these spectra have been fit using a gyrosynchrotron emission model using which we have been able to estimate the magnetic field of this particular CME. So, these two spectra are just a few minutes apart, something like 14 minutes apart and you see a significant change in the emission observed from there, in the shape of the gyrosynchrotron spectra and even in the value of the magnetic field which has been measured for these. So, it is telling you that this is something which is a very dynamic system. So, this is a demonstration that with uh, this new capability which we have, we can now expect to routinely model the observed spectra of radio spectra of CMEs and estimate their magnetic fields. This is really a crucial step for understanding the CMEs and their evolution. Okay. Another application of this very high dynamic range imaging is what is shown in this figure. So, this is a huge field of view, something like 35 degrees by 35 degrees on a side. At the very center is where the sun should have been and all of these purple boxes, they mark the locations of known sources observed in a low radio frequency survey. Uh, it is not seen clearly in this particular image, but if you are able to zoom in, you will find that inside each of these purple boxes, there is a detection of a source. What has been done to produce this image is actually that the sun was imaged every half a second and every 160 kilohertz and a model for the sun was subtracted from these data and something like 350 such imaging slices were added together to produce this image. So, what we are now able to do is akin to being able to see stars in the daytime, right. So, we have removed all the flux from the, from the sun and these comparatively bright sources, these 10 Jansky sources, all of these we are able to detect with a significance of 5 sigma or above. This is really our, our step forward to achieve an objective which I want to elaborate in the next slide. What decides whether the CME is coming towards the earth will be geo effective or not? is their, the topology of their magnetic field, whether or not they have a significant southwardly directed magnetic field or not. Right now, the only way we get to know of that is that when these CMEs have already hit our instruments, our satellites at L1, 
but by then we have just about half an hour left for the CME to reach earth and there is no possibility to take any corrective measures. So what is really important is if we could measure the magnetic fields of these CMEs while they are still far away in the interplanetary space. That is what we are trying to do here or at least that is what is our long term objective here. This yellow uh, curve or yellow shape is a schematic representation of a CME which is propagating out in the interplanetary space. Now imagine that this background map was really a polarized intensity map of all the background polarization from the galactic uh, synchrotron emission which we see and we were able to precisely measure the Faraday rotation because of the CME plasma as it passes through our field of view. If we were really able to do that, then we would have the ability to constrain a detailed three-dimensional model of the magnetic field of this flux rope. And from that, one would be able to quantitatively estimate the geo-effectiveness of this CME. Now, this is a very challenging measurement, requires dynamic range exceeding a million and really exquisite calibration of the ionospheric Faraday rotation, but this is a long-term objective towards which we are shooting. And that brings me to the end of what I wanted to say to you and I'll leave you with some resources if you wanted to learn more about each of the things I have mentioned.